Good morning, New Hope. Let's all stand and sing It Came Upon a Midnight Clear. It came upon the midnight clear, that glorious song of old. From angels bending near the earth to touch their harps of gold. Peace on the earth, goodwill to men from heaven's all gracious King. The world in solemn stillness lay to hear the angels sing. For lo, the days are hastening on by prophets seen of old, when with the ever circling years shall come the time foretold. When peace shall over all the earth Its ancient splendors flee And the, the whole world sing back This morning's scripture reading is Genesis 34, 3 through 17. His soul was strongly attracted to Dinah, the daughter of Jacob, and he loved the young woman and spoke kindly to the young woman. So Shechem spoke to his father, Hamor, saying, Give me this young woman as my wife. And Jacob heard that he had defiled Dinah, his daughter. Now his sons were with livestock in the field. So Jacob held his peace until they came. Then Hamor, the father of Shechem, went out to Jacob to speak with him. And the sons of Jacob came in from the field when they had heard it, and the men were grieved and very angry because he had done a disgraceful thing in Israel by lying with Jacob's daughter, a thing which ought not to be done. But Hamor spoke with them, saying, The soul of my son Shechem longs for your daughter. Please give her to him as a wife and make marriages with us. Give your daughters to us and take our daughters to yourselves. So you shall dwell with us and the land shall be before you. Dwell and trade in it and acquire possessions for yourselves in it. Then Shechem said to her father and her brothers, let me find favor in your eyes and whatever you say to me, I will give. Ask me ever so much dowry and gift and I will give according to what you say to me, but give me the young woman as my wife. But the sons of Jacob answered Shechem and Hamor's father, and spoke deceitfully, because he had defiled Dinah, their sister. And they said to them, We cannot do this thing to give our sister to one who is uncircumcised, for that would be a reproach to us. But on this condition we will consent to you, if you will become as we are, if every male of, of you is circumcised, then we will give our daughters to you, and we will take your daughters to us, and we will dwell with you, and we will become one people. But if you do not heed us and be circumcised, then we will take our daughter and be going. Thank you. One more time and sing, We Three Kings. Royal beauty bright 
westward leading still proceed guide us to thy perfect life born a king on Bethlehem's plain gold I bring to crown him again king forever ceasing never over us all to Star of wonder, star of night, star with royal beauty bright, westward leading still proceeding, guide us to thy perfect light. Glorious now, behold him arise, King and God and last sentence is your prayer this morning. Say amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, Lord, we can come to your house. And, and Lord, we thank you for this new year that's about to come in, Heavenly Father, and we just ask that as this new year comes in, Lord, we just live to serve and honor you and please you. And Lord, now we thank you for this time we can come back and give a portion of back what you have so richly blessed us with, Lord. And we just thank you for all you're going to do for us and all you're going to give us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Isn't that the mandate for 2024? Go tell it on the mountain, right? And what are you going to tell? You're going to tell the gospel, right? Well, I got to tell it like it is. Last night, Heather was working on the bulletin, and she writes Jan and uh, says, Marty didn't put a title down for his message. What's your title? And I said, I don't know. Pile it on. That's a good one. Pile it on. So she's, pile it on. I said, yeah, pile it on. At least that's what... I guess God gave me, but very appropriate, very appropriate for what the message is about today. In fact, today's message is not a very comfortable one. It's one where it would be very easy to skip a few pages and go on to something that's a little bit more positive, especially as we're entering a brand new year. But God's Word is there for a reason, and uh, therefore we're going we're gonna to spend time with it. We're not talking about piling on uh, the snow or piling on rain, or piling on sickness, what the scripture today is talking about is sin. It's talking about, it's enough to sin, but when we begin to pile sin upon sin upon sin, uh, there are going to be some real, real problems. And we'll see, this is what takes place in the scripture today. To bring you back to where we were, we're in Genesis chapter 34. And we ended in verses 3 and 4, and just to uh, give you a reminder of what's taking place here, you remember that, uh, that uh, Jacob's daughter, Dinah, is involved here. He, has, he had 12 sons, and he had daughters, but the only daughter that's mentioned in Scripture is Dinah. 
And Dinah, his daughter, was, was, was uh, uh, assaulted, we'll put it that way, or we'll put it another way, she was raped by a prince, and his name was Shechem. And uh, he comes from a very wealthy family, and I would say in terms of today, uh, politically, uh, they were very prestigious in the, the land that they lived in. And um, he came upon the diner, and, and this caused a problem. And we know, and God's word says, this is sin when this takes place. And now we take these two families, and we take a look at these two families, and we see what the attitudes are and what they do as a result of this sin. And I'm going to ask in a little while as we go into this story, and I'm going to give you several possibilities. And if this were you and this happened in your family, what would you do and what would your answer be? What would you humanly be thinking of doing and what do you feel that God wants you to do? And it's not very easy sometimes when things happen, especially in the family, to do the right thing, even when you try to do the right thing. Uh, but when we put God in the equation, uh, he gives us an idea of what we, should, what we should do. And sometimes it's far from what we think we ought to do. Because when our emotions are involved, our emotions kind of move us in the direction sometimes that God does not want us to go. And so rather than moving by emotion, we need to move by what God's word says. So as we come to verse 3, let me read it just again. It says, and his soul clave unto Dinah, the daughter of Jacob, and he loved the damsel and spoke kindly unto the damsel. Verse 4. And Shechem spoke unto his father, Hamar, saying, let me, let, let me this damsel to, to wed. In other words, he was saying here, something has taken place here. He did something that was wrong. Sin took place. But along the way here, he's falling in love with her. And so now he goes to his father, who is prestigious and has a lot of authority. He says, I want this girl. Do what you can do for me to get this girl. And this is where they are at this particular, at this particular time. The very interesting thing is that, that somehow in what's taken place, he's fallen in love with her. At least that's what it indicates here. It doesn't say much about what her attitude is at this particular point, but it gives us an inkling a little bit later that she kind of is agreeing with this, even though I don't know what, exactly what her attitude is concerning this. Verse 5 says, And Jacob, Jacob uh, Dinah's father, heard uh, that he had defiled Dinah, his daughter. Now the sons who were with the cattle in the field, and Jacob held his peace until they were come. Now, Rather than just hearing the scripture read in the cold print, I want you to paint a picture of what's taking place here. If this were you and your family, dads, and you had just found out that your daughter had been raped, what would your attitude be? Jacob evidently is very angry at this particular point, and yet he's holding his anger, and he's waiting for his sons to come from the field to be with him before he confronts the situation. Now, why is he doing that? Perhaps he just needs some support. Uh, there could be many reasons why he's doing that, but it says here he's waiting for his sons to come from the field to be with him. Verse 6 says, And Hamar, the father of Shechem, went out unto Jacob to commune with him. So now we have two families. We have two fathers here. There's something has taken place that affects both families and affects their children, and they're coming together, and if this were you as a dad or a dad and a mom, and you were going to meet the family for the first time under the circumstances, how would you feel? I was kind of reminded of a situation that really doesn't have anything to do with this, and except it's a light situation as far as something very stressful taking place between families. You remember the mass murder that took place in Columbine. You remember there was one young girl that uh, when the shooter came and she was under her desk and he asked her, are you a Christian? And she said, yes, I am. And he shot her and killed her. James Dobson said he met with that family one day in the church, some months later. And the two families, the parents of the shooter and the parents of the daughter were to meet. 
And if you were in that room waiting for the other family to come, what would be going through your mind at this point? What would, you be, what would your reaction be if it had been your daughter and you're about to meet the parents whose son had murdered your daughter and so many other children? Kind of hard, isn't it? It's kind of hard not to have the emotions to be working. And this is what was taking place here. James Dobson said that when the couple whose son had shot the daughter walked into that room, there was silent just for a moment. And then the parents of the daughter rushed over and embraced the other husband and wife. And there was forgiveness. And there was tears. That's the way God wants us to react to situations. That's the way God wants us to react to sin. Billy Graham said that when his daughter announced that she was pregnant without the benefit of marriage, and as she drove up in the car with her baby in her arms, she was concerned and worried about the reaction that Billy Graham, after all, the nation's pastor, she had, she had just done something that affected his ministry. She just said, he's going to be so angry with me. But as she got out of that car, Billy Graham came out of the house, rushed up to her, and embraced her and the baby. And all was well. All was well. That's the way it should be. I remember years ago when a young lady in our church in, in, uh, in Maine got pregnant without the benefit of marriage. What would the ad attitude of the average congregation be? when this kind of sin has taken place? What would be the attitude of the people in the congregation? The attitude of the people in this congregation was that some churches would not have let her sing in the choir, but she sang in the choir and they embraced her, they gave her a party, they showed they loved her, and as a result of that, she grew in the Lord and she became a vibrant member of that church because of forgiveness. And so this is really going to be a story down the line of where God is working in the hearts but in the meantime, sin is being piled upon sin. Verse 7 says, And the sons of Jacob came out of the field when they heard it, and the men were grieved, and they were very wroth, because he had wrought folly on, brought folly on Israel in lying with Jacob's daughter, which thing ought not have, to have been done. The two words I want to focus on here is, they were very wroth. They weren't angry. They had moved from anger to wrath. We go back to Genesis in the very beginning. Remember the first two children of Adam and Eve? Cain's offering was not accepted by the Lord. Abel's offering was accepted. Cain was very envious and jealous, and his anger became into wrath, and that wrath led to the next level, which was murder. And the first murder took place. So we'll see what happens with this wrath. And we certainly agree that it should not have been taken place, what took place. But the thing that I want you to remind you of this morning that is so important, that first of all, God never wants us to sin. He tells us that he always gives us a way out of it. But unfortunately, we don't always take that way, do we? We sin. But the point that I want to make here is that once we sin, whatever that sin is, it's done and it cannot be taken back. And many people and many families and many congregations can't move beyond that point. And we need to move beyond that point and accept the fact that something has happened and now what do we do as a result of it that's positive for the future? For the individual, for the family, and for the church. And this is what this story is all about. And you've heard me say this before, those of you that have been here, it's very important, though, as a Christian, that we understand what happens when we sin. We know that when we receive Jesus Christ as our Savior, that God says He's forgiven all of our sin, past, present, and future. When He went to the cross and shed His blood, and He said, just before He died, it is finished, the work that He had come here for was finished. And that was to, to take upon Himself our punishment 
and to offer the gift of forgiveness to all who would receive it. And when you get to heaven, he does not parade, parade that sin before you. He doesn't even remember what it was according to the scripture. But nevertheless, we also know that we sin as a Christian. And some have taken this as a license that if God has forgiven my sins, then I guess I have, I can sin because God's forgiven me. And Paul says, God forgive, for God forgive if that is our attitude. Because there is always a consequence for sin, as we'll see in the, in the story that we're dealing with this week and next week. And so, as we sin as Christians, we need to exercise that verse that you've heard so many times in 1 John 1, 9. If we confess that sin, He, God, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's not because we're righteous, as it was said in Sunday school, it's His righteousness that is within us when we yield to Him. If we do not confess the sin as a Christian, then we are separated from God in the blessing that He wants to pour upon us. In other words, we have set up a, a chasm between us and God as Christians. Because we are living in sin, we haven't confessed that sin, and we're going to have consequences for that sin. And I don't have to spell out what these consequences are. They vary, and there are many that are based, based upon the sin, but those of you that have been involved in sin, and all of us have, can look back over your lives if you've got any age on your life, and you can look and say, yep, these are the consequences. This is the consequence of, of the mistake that I made when I, when I sinned. It says, when Jacob heard it, he waited for his boys to come in, and they had what we'll call a war council. They said, now what are we going to do about this situation? Jacob probably would have been able to make the decision on his own, and probably should have as the head of the household at that particular point, but he called his boys in, and this caused some problems as they united together, and as you get any group of people together and you try to decide upon something, you'll know that every, everyone has a different opinion. And in the end result, usually there's going to be an opinion that's going to be accepted and that is going to be what takes place. And that may be good, it may not be good, except the Bible tells us that there are many, there is wisdom in many counselors. So you can see there's a mixed bag here, what's taking place here, and, uh, but the end result is, is what takes place is God is not pleased at all. What's, what's taking place here. Verse 8 says, And Hamar uh, communed with them, saying, The soul of my son, Sikkim, longeth for your daughter. I pray you give her to be wife. Um, what would you have done at this particular point? Let me give you the different scenarios that takes place here. In this particular instance, daughter had been raped. The two fathers got together, and, and Jacob's son got together, and, and uh, I'm sure the family on the other side got together, and they, they decided, well, what are we going to do about this? And we don't know what Diner's attitude is here, so that doesn't really help us too much, other than it looks like she may have gone along with this because he said he loved her. But let's say your daughter came home and said, I was raped. What would your first reaction be? Probably, who is he? Do you love him? And she says, well, no, it was just a one-night stand. What do you do next? Or she comes home and she says, I'm pregnant. And you ask the question, who is it? And she said, it's my boyfriend. Do you love him? Yes, I love him. Does he love you? Yes, he loves me. What would you be your reaction? Or she comes home and she says, I'm pregnant. Who is it? And she says, the boy I've been going with. Do you love him? No. Does he love you? No. What would your reaction be? 
and you can add some scenarios to this, it's not an easy situation, is it? What would God have you to do? It's probably only you that can answer that question based upon what your relationship is with God in searching God's word and maybe searching out the counsel of others. I know it would not be an easy decision for me. I know that my son came to me one day when he was, I don't know, probably 18 years old. And he said, uh, Dad, and he did come to me, ask my permission, give him credit for that. And he said, uh, Dad, he says, I, I just met a girl at work, and he says, I, I love her, and I want to marry her, and uh, I, I'd like to have your blessing. And I said, does she know the Lord Jesus Christ as her Savior? And he says, well, she knows Jesus <laughs> and knows who he is. And he mentioned a religion from which she was from. I said, Dad, I said, I said, you know what the scripture says as well as I do, that the Bible says, do not be unequally yoked. And he kind of hung his head. That was a weighty thing to hang upon him when, when he was in love. And uh, I said, but if you decide to do it, I said, we'll bring her into the family and we'll treat her just like a daughter. But I said, you obey God's word as God speaks to you. Well, you know what happened as well as I do. You married her. And it didn't work out. A couple of children. And we'll talk about that in just a few moments as we get into the scripture because it has a great deal to do with what has taken place here. In the ninth verse it says, And make ye marriages with us, and give your daughters unto us, and take our daughters unto you. Now they're piling the sin on. And you'll notice that as you go through what's going on place, the focus now is no longer on the sin of rape. The focus on what is best for your family, what is best for my family, and what are going to do for each other, and they've completely bypassed the original sin that has taken place, and they're piling sin upon sin. Now, back in the Old Testament, the Israelites held their, their, their faith very, very close to themselves. In fact, if you married outside of the Israelite faith, you were considered a Samaritan. You remember the stories about the Samaritans? And Samaritans basically were those that a, a Jew would marry somebody of another faith. They were hated by the Jews. In fact, you remember the story when Jesus or any of them traveled through Samaritan land. They traveled around it. They went the longer way, so they didn't even have to step foot on the land that belonged to the Samaritans. There was animosity there. There was no marriage beyond marriage within the faith that you're in. And yet we see here that what is being offered here is that uh, if you allow your son, if you allow your, your, your daughter to marry our son, then we will be able to marry your daughters, your, your, your women and, and, and your religion, and you'll be able to marry ours and our religion, and we'll just be one big happy family. Can you see how sin is being piled upon sin? Verse 10, it said, And ye shall dwell with us, and the land shall be before you. Dwell and trade ye therein, and get your possessions therein. In other words, if we can come together this way, what we have belongs to you, and what you have belongs to us. One big happy family, and we come together. You see what's happening in the Middle East? Never going to be one happy family there, is it? Just isn't going to happen. Two different religions trying to get along, and it isn't, and it isn't going to take place. Verse 11 says, And Shechem said unto her father, Abraham, and unto her brethren, her brothers, Let me find grace in your, in your eyes, and what ye shall say unto me I will give. Now he's piling sin upon sin. He's saying, If you will do this, if you agree to what we're, we're, we're offering here, then um, I will give you anything that you want. Now, once again, the tradition back then was when a man wanted to marry a woman, he provided a dowry, which was a, a number of different things that had value to the family of the bride. And so he's saying here, we will provide a dowry, and anything you want, you just say it. After all, he was very wealthy. And so he had the money or the means or the goods or whatever to do this. He was making a bargain. 
Verse 12. Ask me never so much dowry and gift, and I will give according as ye shall say unto me. Now this is a threat almost, but give me the damsel. He didn't say please. He's making a threat here. Give me the damsel. I will do this, you will do this, and you will provide me with your daughter for my son. Now as Jacob listens to all this that's going on between his sons and that other family, Jacob's going to have to move on from where they are at this particular point. He knows that this is wrong. And this is no place for him mixing with these people in this land. He's already has gone through this once before, remember. God told him to get away from Uncle Laban, get away from those idol worshipers, and go back home before his sons were affected by the type of worship that was taking place in the family of Uncle Laban. Verse 13. And the sons of Jacob answered Shechem and Hamor, his father, deceitfully, and said, because he had defiled Dinah, their sister, their sister. Now they have piled more sin on, and they're being deceitful in what they're going to do and what they're going to offer. This is not pleasing God. It says here, I feel that Jacob should certainly have taken the leadership in his family. First of all, he should have prevented his sons from deceiving Shechem and Hamor. In verse 14 it says, And they said unto him, We cannot do this thing to give, your, to give your sister to one that is uncircumcised, for that were a reproach unto us. Now they're piling another sin on here. Now Jacob is coming back, or Jacob's son is coming back, and he says, We'll accept your offer, but you need to become circumcised. Now you could become an Israelite, or you could become a Jew by being circumcised. But by being circumcised, you also had to accept their religion, accept their law, and literally become a Jew. This is not taking place here. This is the same as somebody comes into the church here, someone says, I got a lot of friends in the church here, and I'd like to join the church. And okay, we're going to interview them. And, uh, but we find out when we interview them that they're not Christians. They're, they're not wanting to join the church because they're Christians and they're the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. They just want to be a part of this group and join the church. Well, we talk about it a little bit. The leadership talks about it. And the pastor talks about it a little bit. And, and we say, well, you know, we're, we really do have a push on for membership. <laughs> and we really do need some members. And after all, a new member will give. So let's let them become a member. Have has that person become a part of the body of Christ if we do that? Later on, that person says, I'd like to be baptized. Because everybody I know in the church here is baptized. But do you know the Lord Jesus Christ is your Savior? Well, no, I, I, I you know, I, I, I believe in him. Well, okay, that, that's enough. We'll baptize you. Would that be right? That wouldn't be right. But this is what's taking place here. They're trying to s cement the deal by offering circumcision, which brings them together, the two religions together, and everything is just going to be hunky-dory and going to be okay. Verse 14. I think I read it, but I'll read it again. And they said unto, unto them, We cannot do this thing to give our sister to one that is uncircumcised, for that we are, it is a reproach. Well, what was the real reproach? The sin, the original sin, was a reproach to God. Verse 15, it goes on to say, But in this will we consent unto you, if you will be as we, as we be that every male of you be circumcised. Verse 16, Then we will give our daughters unto you, and we will take our daughters to, and we will take your daughters to us, and we will dwell with you, 
and we will become one people. We will become one big happy family, sure. 17, but if you will not hearken unto us to be circumcised, then will we take your daughter and we will be gone. We're out of here if you don't do that. Wow, this is some pretty, bar pretty bad bargaining, isn't it, at this particular point? Let me read to you what one particular commentary and pastor said about this portion of Scripture. He says, this, this ought to be a warning today to a great many people. He says, I recall one couple who came to me for counseling and asked me to perform their marriage ceremony. I would not unite them in marriage because he was not a Christian. And she claimed that she should not marry him because he be until he became a Christian. I talked with him and he said he would accept Christ. We had prayed and I asked him, what have you really done? And he says, I have never heard such hemming and hawing and beating around the bush as this boy did. And very frankly, I said right in front of him, young lady, I'll, let, I'll not perform the ceremony. I don't think the young man is saved. And they felt that I was very harsh. And they went down the street and they got another preacher to perform the ceremony and marry them. And they were married. And, they and, and she tried to get him to go to church. And of course he had a good reason for not coming to my church any longer because I was so cruel to them in my decision. But then she agreed to go to another church and they went two or three, two or three times. And finally he just said to her point blank, Really, I'm not a Christian. Just to go through the ceremony of joining the church and even of saying that you trust Christ doesn't mean that, that you have. I find that faith doesn't seem to, to mean very much to a great many people today, he said. Not long ago, I received a telephone call from a man that I knew very well, a Christian, and his wife had died that year, uh, several months before. And he found, and he was, I would say that he was in his 60s. And uh, in the meantime, he had found another woman who was a Christian. And uh, he said, I would like to have you perform our marriage. I said, great, that's wonderful. He said, but, he says, I just want you to perform the ceremony. He says, I don't want it to be legal. I kind of shook my, you don't want it to be illegal. He says, no. He says, you see, when her husband died, she gets his pension from his work. And she gets it for the rest of her life unless she marries. And when she marries, it stops. So we want to be married before God's eyes, but we don't want to mar be married according to the law, or according to the state. Hmm. I said I couldn't do it. Romans chapter 11 says we are to obey the laws of the land unless they're contrary to God's laws. I said, what about your pastor? He said, well, I've already spoken to him. He wouldn't marry us either. <laughs> and they moved out of the area and they're moving in, living in another state and everybody believes that they're man and wife but they do not have the benefit of marriage. Now, whether or not I made the right decision, I don't know, but it was the right decision I felt that I had to make. Other pastors would have probably married them with the attitude that it, if they're living together, they might have, well, have the benefit of marriage. I don't know. It's not an easy decision sometimes when somebody, come, somebody comes to you. I remember years ago, another pastor, I was in a pastor's meeting, and it was during that time where there was an awful lot to do with mixed marriages and so on, and... and uh, uh, he said a, a young couple came and knocked on his door. She was black and he was white. And uh, they asked if he could marry him. And he said, you know, with what was going on in the newspapers and everything, that there was an awful lot to do about mixed marriages at that time, which we don't have a problem with at this particular point. But this is a, a few decades ago. And he says, I, I knew, he says, they were just testing me. And he says, I knew if I said no to them, I would be in the newspaper the next day. He says, so I simply said, I need to have several weeks of counseling with you. <laughs> and he said, and we need to know whether you blow, both know Jesus Christ as your Savior. Oh, he never heard from him again. 
that took care of that. That was a, a wise decision on this particular point. Let me leave with you one more, one more example. Actually, I've got a couple, but one more that talks about uh, uh, what it says in the New Testament. The New Testament is very clear that says you are not to be unequally yoked, which means that you are not to marry, as a Christian, you are not to marry somebody of another faith. But I want, as I say that, I want to remind you once again that if that happens, it's done, and now you have to deal with it for the future in a positive direction. But God's will is that that doesn't take place. You all heard of Mark Twain, right? We all know who Mark Twain is. Well, Mark Twain had the same experience. He was not a Christian, and he was in love with a very beautiful, wonderful Christian girl. She would not marry him until he became a Christian. He professed to have accepted Christ as a Savior, and they started out their marriage that way. Well, Mark Twain became very famous, and he was entertained by many famous people in the world. And one day, when he came back to his home in Missouri, and she wanted to go to church, he says, Look, I can't keep up this front any longer. You go on to church. I know now that I am not a Christian. And my, may I say, that made a very unhappy home, and it absolutely spoiled the life of this love, lovely Christian girl. We had a woman in our church in New Hampshire who was a, a wonderful Christian lady, but she married somebody that was not a Christian and he wouldn't have anything to do with the church. Didn't try to stop her from going to church, but he wouldn't have anything to do with the church. For 25 years, she would get up in the evening services when we had our testimony time and she said, would you pray for my husband that he comes to the Lord? 25 years. She lived, as the scripture says, if this happens, the woman is not to nag the husband, or vice versa. You are to live the way God wants you to live as a woman before your man and let your life, as Christ works through you, minister to him and he may become a Christian or vice versa. One day the pastor received a telephone call 25 years later. She says, would you visit my husband in the hospital? He has cancer and he only has a few days to live. He went to the hospital the man was open and ready, and he prayed, and he received Jesus Christ as his Savior. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much, or woman. These are not hard decisions, as I painted the picture of the different scenarios that could take place here, but when these things happen, we need to try to put emotions over to one side and say, but what does God's word say? What would be the right thing? What would be the thing that would cause a positive thing to take place for the future and still be within God's plan for one's life? Sin does not ruin a person's life if sin is forgiven and asked for forgiveness. You move on from there and you can still have a victorious Christian life. Heavenly Father, living the Christian life is not an easy life. The Bible tells us that we need to take up our cross and we need to bear the cross, and many of us will have a cross to bear during our, our lives here on earth. But he has promised us in Romans 8.28, that he causes all things to work for good to them that are called according to his name. This means that when things take place that are not pleasing to God, or we find ourselves in circumstances where, where we're uncomfortable, we're sick, we've lose, lost a loved one, he didn't cause it, but he promises us that if we love him, truly love him, he will turn that into something that is good for the future, for us and for others. And it's a claim that we can just cling on to for all of our lives, knowing that you have a plan for us, and that plan is always, always for the good for those who love him. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your word. Thank you for the word that is not comfortable sometimes to even read or listen to, but yet we need to because we constantly need to be drawn to you and to come closer to you that we walk the plan that you have for each one of our lives. And I just pray here today that if there's anybody here today that is going through a very difficult time, 
whether it is dealing with a sin or sickness or a loss or discouragement or whatever it may be, may they realize that there is always hope in you and you're willing to give that peace that passes all understanding and that there is indeed a future for you and that future will be a good one based upon your plan if, and, the, and it's a big if, if we truly do love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you stand as we sing our invitational hymn, Joy to the World. <clears throat> Here, she okay. can't get down here. <clears throat> okay. Thank you for being our pastor this past year. We look forward to what the Lord has in store for okay. us in 2024. Thank you. Thank you, Jan, Thank you. for being our musician. You've done a great job. We appreciate you. As a token of our appreciation, we'd like to give you this. Thank you, Leonard. Appreciate it. <clears throat> you know where it's going to go. <clears throat> <laughs> and I love you too. <clears throat> God is doing something in our beds, and I hope you feel the joy in what's taking place in this church. And it wouldn't have happened if it hadn't been for you. It wouldn't have happened if it hadn't been so many new, these new people that have come to us today that are on fire for the Lord. And we love them and uh, for what's taking place in this church. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we approach the new year, we expect, because you want us to expect it, that you're going to do great and mighty things in our midst. We pray that you bring through the doors of this church people that need to know you in a personal way, people that are hurting, people that need to hear your word, people that need to be in fellowship with other believers that can give, you, give them counsel and to give them support and to show their love for them, Lord. Help us to be all that you want us to be and to be what you want us to be as a church, Lord, and nothing more. We ask now your blessing upon us as we leave this sanctuary. Walk with us throughout this day and throughout this week and bring us back together. In your name we pray. Amen.